All right, so I feel a little closer to you. Amen. All right, so pray for me because I am a bit nervous. Doesn't look like it, but my heart is my heart is racing. <laughs> I heard that all of these things have to happen. Uh, it's a sign that you you are ready. I guess. All right. Um, before we begin, let us pray. Our Father and our God who art in heaven, we thank you so much for everything that you've done, for bringing me to this point where we can share this first message with uh, our church family here at Grace. Father, we ask that as I speak, myself will fade into the background and you will become more visible and that the message that will be shared here today will resonate with everyone in their own way and it will be a means of drawing them, us, closer to you. We thank you, Father, for all you've done and for hearing an answer in our prayers. Amen. Amen. All right. So, if you have your Bibles, I think everyone has a Bible. If you don't have one, there's one in the pew. So we'll be reading through the Bible today. All right. And the title of this sermon is, oh, it's up there, A Night on the Lake. All right. Now, this, this, um, this sermon is... Uh, based on the events that took place in Matthew chapter 14, as you read um, earlier, John chapter 6, 6, verse 17 to 20, and Mark chapter 6, verse 45 to 52. Now, most of the sermon will focus on Matthew chapter 14, and ever so often, to corroborate the story, we'll go back and into the, the other stories. And also, as reference, um, the book the Desire, the Desire of Ages, chapter 40, also talks about the events in detail. So we'll be um, quoting from some of th those references also. All right. <clears throat> so the, the events described in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33, comes at the end of a series of events. The first, uh, well, both of those series, they, they, they were both um, joyous events and tragic events. The tragic event was that Matthew starts off with the beheading of John the Baptist. Mm. Right? The joyous event it comes in the form that Christ was meeting with his disciples after he had sent them out on a missionary journey. He had sent them out two by two, and they were coming back together to give a report. A report about the things they had seen, the miracles that they had done, their failures. And among these stories, Christ was hearing for the first time that John the Baptist was beheaded. He had known John was in prison. However, because his journeys had taken him away from, from um, the, the area, um, Capernaum, he may not have heard about John the Baptist. So in hearing that story, um, one of the things that, I mean, as most of us would, when you hear terrible news, you tend to retreat to a place where you can think. And Christ and his disciples did the same thing. They retreated to a place where they can think, where they can grieve, where they can commune with each other. Now, <clears throat> We do not know exactly when um, Christ found out, but scholars have been able to tell us that Christ found out at the closing of his Galilean ministry. Now, they break his, they break, uh, scholars broke Christ's ministry up into several pieces, and this was the second time Christ was going into, into Galilee. So him hearing this was actually a few months after John had died. Okay? Now... <clears throat> They went to the a, a, a secluded area just outside of, of, um, of Bethany, Beth, Bethsidia, sorry. And Bethsidia is a small town on the shores of Galilee. And it's surrounded by, um, by mountains. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking lush green mountains with a nice view of the ocean. Nobody is around. So, sounds like a, they went on a vacation, right? So even Christ took vacation. So for those of you who work, 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 
take the example of your of your savior. Take a vacation once in a while. All right. Now, the Sea of Galilee is an interesting body of water. Okay, it is completely surrounded by land, so that means that it's not a sea, but a lake. Correct. In the gospel, it has many names. And the names changed based on who was ruling at the time. So the disciples reference, reference it to as the Sea of Galilee. Um, there was the Sea of Tiberias, which the Romans uh, called. There was a the lake of Gennesaret, or Gennesaret. And if you, if you were to see a picture of the, uh, the lake, uh, someone said that it looks like a harp. That's where the name Gennesaret uh, came from. So... <clears throat> If you were to think of the map, Christ was somewhere in the north, I would say on the top left, if the map was vertical, okay? And Capernaum, where they were, was on the top left, sorry, so top right, top left. All right. So geographically, the Sea of Galilee is known to be the second lowest body of water on the face of the earth, okay? It's about 700 feet, six to 700 feet below sea level, and what I found out, which I didn't know, was that it is fed by the Jordan River and then, and then eventually pours out into the Dead Sea, which we know is the lowest point, lowest body of water um, on the surface of the earth. And, and geologists tell us that this, this interesting area is formed as the tectonic plates of the Northern African, uh, the Northern African Plate rubs against the Arabian Plate, pushing this area up into mountains and valleys. Okay. Now, the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles long by 8 miles wide. And if you were to walk around, it would take you about, well, you'd be walking for about 32 miles. And at the deepest point, it's about 141 41 feet. So the best form of transportation to get to the other side was by boat. Except if you couldn't swim like me, then you might want to walk. <laughs> Now the hills, the hills around Galilee rises to about 2,000 feet. And what that does, when you think about a lake, which in the surrounding region is semi-tropical, the air at the surface of the lake is warm and moist. The air at the top of the mountain is cool and dry. And what that creates is um, pressure and temperature gradients, right? which can, over time, under the right condition, create some really serious storms. Now, physics tells us hot air rises, cold air sinks. So as so you can imagine that as the, as the sun goes down, the cold air sinks, and the hills funnel the, water, the air, the wind, over in towards the center of the lake. And you can imagine that such winds can have a dramatic effect on the surface of a, a small lake. Right? Um, <clears throat> The, the nearest comparator we have on this continent is the Great Lakes. Lake Erie is the smallest and the more shallow of them, and it is known to have um, high, suffer from um, high winds and uh, big uh, high, or suffer from the influence of wind a little bit faster than the other, the other lakes. Um, so when you, when you take this picture into, into mind, you can see that it was under those conditions that the apostles found themselves on the lake. The temperature had gone down, the wind was rushing in, and they were struggling to survive. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let us go with me to your Bibles. All right, it won't be on the screen, so you guys have to open your Bibles. All right, and then I will, uh, I will read in your hearing. So when you, when you have it, say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 14, and we will go straight to verse 22. And it says, And straight away Jesus constrained his disciples to get them into a ship to go before him onto the other side while he sent away the multitudes. Now, as you're reading this, one of the first things that will come to mind is, wait, why is Jesus um, sending his disciples away? But when you look at the words, there's something, something about it that is very urgent. Right? He said straight away. Another word, word for straight away would be immediately. Right? So something has to happen for you to move 
immediately. And then the next word that, that it use, he uses here is constrained. A word synonymous with constrained is to compel. So the verse is telling us that immediately, something was happening, that immediately Christ told his disciples, and it wasn't just a telling, he compelled his disciples to get into that boat and go to the other side. All right? Now, verse 22 doesn't tell us what that thing is. Right? So we have to go back a little bit further to try to understand what was happening that caused Christ to compel his disciples. And, and in the Desire of Ages, um, Sister White said that he spoke to them in a way that he had never spoken to them before. All right? So there was some urgency um, in, his, in his voice. All right? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> so the story that we're going to go into is sandwiched between two critical events. The first one was the, the retelling of the, the beheading of John the Baptist, all right? And the next, sorry, it, it comes after, sorry, the beheading of John the Baptist and the feeding of the 5,000, which is a, a, a very important miracle in the, in the, um, in the ministry of, of Christ. Uh, now, think about it for a second. Christ had gone away on vacation and somehow, somewhere, somebody found out where he was. And somehow, somewhere, some way, you ended up with five, more than 5,000 people around, right? He wanted a vacation and he got a tent series. <laughs> but because of the compassion that Christ had for his followers, he did not turn them away. Instead, he taught them about what was to come. He fed them spiritually. He took care of their needs. Whoever was sick was healed. And at the end of the day, as, as the sun was about to go down, they had been out all day, he decided to take care of their hunger, right? To feed them. And in doing so, he found, he goes, we, the, the, start, the, the Bible tells us that he find, they found five loaves and two fishes, and he fed them, fed them. Now, <clears throat> now, as the people were relaxing afterwards, they had been fed spiritually, they had been, their needs were taken care of, the thought started to, 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 to brew among the people. All right. Now, if you, understood the, if you understand the history of the, uh, of, the, of the Jews, they were people, because of their stubbornness, were, they were constantly under somebody's oppression. And their thought was that the Messiah would come to save them from that. And that thought started to brew. So they saw the miracles. They saw that he fed the 5,000. And you can imagine that... At some point, they would have remembered all the years in the desert that Christ fed them with manna. And they would have remembered Moses' this writing about the Messiah coming to save them. Right? And in, in all of that, they thought, this guy is a good guy. This guy can perform miracles. He treats people with respect. We can make him king. Right? And this, this is not brought out in Matthew. But the Apostle John tells us in John 6 and verse 15 that the people were ready to take Jesus by force and make him king. And that was what was going on. All right? They were ready to make him king at this moment. Now Christ, having the foresight, saw the, 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 this, heard the discussion and saw, that they, they saw the intents of their heart. And he decided, no, this can't happen. Right? Well, the people were thinking that if they could raise him to be king, then as a leader, he can take them to war. And if he can take five loaves and break it, and, and this, is, this is probably something that we would like to see. You break it, you give away, there's still more. You break it, you give away, there's still more. You break it, you give away, and you take a fish and you pinch a little bit and you give it away. The people were satisfied. If he can do that, 
then your armies does not need to bring a whole lot of food. <laughs> right? Because right. food takes up a lot of space in a Calvary. So if he can do that, then hey, we don't have to worry about food. <laughs> and if he can heal somebody, yes. when you're wounded, you don't need a doctor. Right. You just call the king and he says, he lays his hand on you and you're healed. Amen. All right? So, you th when you take that into context, the people were thinking, this guy can lead us to a position of preeminence in the world. One that they believed at the time was the rightful um, birthright. Right? But Christ did not come to become king on earth. Essentially, he came to die. Right? And it is because of that, those thoughts that were going on, and the influence that it was having on the disciples that Christ said, get out of here, let's go. Go to the other side, meet me in Capernaum. Amen. Right? And he went back and he dispersed the people. Now the, 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 the Bible says that he went back and he sent the people away. But if he was stern with the disciples, imagine how much more stern he was with the individuals who were instigating that problem. Mm. All right? <clears throat> Now, where am I? All right. Now, let's go on to verse uh, 20, 23. So while you look for that, I'll, I'll, I'll read one thing. It says, With this understanding, Jesus moved quickly to quell their plans. This was... This is why there is a sense of urgency in Matthew 14, verse 22. Jesus was decisive in his action to firmly, quickly redirect his disciples to dispense the crowd and to prevent this plot from taking root. Similarly, when we ourselves, when we allow ourselves to be placed in situations that would be detrimental to us, God compels us through his word. This is the way walking in it. Yeah. So essentially he was sending them away um, so that they do not deviate from the way that he had planned for them. Alright, let's go to verse 23. And when he had said, send the multitudes away, he, he went up into the mountains apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And we see this over and over in the ministry of Christ. That he took time away from everything, away from the hustle and the bustle, to pray. And one night of praying was nothing to him. After all, he had already finished 40 days and 40 nights of praying. Mm -hmm. right. So one night of praying was, no, was nothing. But that, that, is, that tells us that there's an example for us also. Amen. That we should take time to pray. To seek God's guidance every day. Amen. To thank Him for His mercies every night. Amen. And as we go through each day, to continually pray for success, but pray for our families, pray for our friends, pray for our church. Okay? Now the desire of ages chapter 40, 40 and, uh, page uh, 379 says, for hours, while he prayed, for hours he continued pleading with God, not for himself, but for men with those prayers. He prayed for power to reveal to men the divine character of his mission, that Satan might not blind their understanding and pervert the judgment. Right? He's praying for protection against Satan. We should be praying for protection against um, Satan. The Savior knew that his days of personal ministry were nearly ended. So this event is happening somewhere in the middle of Christ's ministries. And in some places it says around AD 30. AD 30. Now, <clears throat> the Savior knew that his days, and his, uh, his days of personal ministry on earth were ended and that few would receive him as Redeemer. In the trials and the conflict of souls, he prayed for his disciples. They were to be grievously tried. And this was just a small test. 
just to get an understanding of the, how, how they understood Christ's ministry. They cherished hopes, they long cherished hopes that a Messiah would come and redeem them from the Romans or place them in a position of high authority were to be disappointed in the most painful and humiliating way. Now, they did not know that then. We, looking back and understanding the Bible, can tell that it was a painful and humiliating um, experience. In the place of, of his exaltation to the throne of da in place of his exaltation to the throne of David, they were to witness his crucifixion. This was to be indeed his true coronation. But they did not see him, they did not discern this, and the consequences and in consequence, strong temptation would come to them, and which would be difficult for them to recognize. And without the Holy Spirit to enlighten the mind and enlarge the, the comprehension, the faith of the disciples would have failed. So you see, Christ was praying for his disciples. He was also praying, and I'd like to think so, for us. He saw thousand years, two thousand years down the line, and understood our situation and prayed for us that we would believe and that our efforts would not go in vain. If Christ pleaded for hours for the protection of his disciples, that the Holy Spirit would enlighten their mind and increase their understanding of faith, how much more are we to pray? To seek God's deliverance and guidance for ourselves, for our children, and for our families. To ask the Holy Spirit to guide our footsteps. The Apostle Paul tells us that we should pray, that in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 18, that we should pray without ceasing. And in, and in Ephesians 6, 18, we are admonished to pray for all the Lord's people. For it is only through the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous, not just a righteous, but a sinner, the effectual, fervent prayer that we lift up to God can help us ex escape the wiles of the devil. Amen. All right? Now let's go back to the Bible. Let's go to verse 24 and continue from there. So Christ has gone up to pray. The disciples um, are in the ship. And it says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. So essentially, they were heading one direction and the wind was coming in the opposite. So they were pushing them way back. Now you can imagine if you have a sail, it will be impossible for you to go forward. Right? So the disciples had to get rid of the sail and we'll, learn, we'll see later that they had to use the oars to control the direction. Okay. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. All right? Now, think about this. The disciples were probably sent out on the sea right around sunset. And this is telling us that they were there until the fourth watch of the, sea, of the night. Now, the Romans had divided the night into four quarters, three hours each. So if you're thinking the fourth watch, what time is it? Approximately where, where do you fall? Between... 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. A journey that would have normally taken them about two to three hours. All right? The apostle, the, um, John also rec records that they were rowing for about three miles by the time Jesus had gone to them. And the waves had pushed them off course. They had been struggling for about eight hours. Had they obeyed the instruction of Christ at the time and left Bethsaida when he told them to, they would have most, most likely gone ahead of the storm or gotten there in time to avoid it. Right? But instead, their disobedience and also the fact that the idea of who Christ was kept them lingering behind. And that caused them a night on the sea where they were afraid. 
fearing for their lives. They were battling. And I don't, I don't know about you, I can't swim, I can't. Uh, I've never been in a boat where the water is rocking because I'll be sick and I'll probably be at the bottom. But <clears throat> <laughs> I'll definitely be scared. But you could imagine that as the wave is coming and they're rowing, the boat is rocking to one way and they have to fight and they have to fight. But it says that in the fourth, in verse um, 25, it says that in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And verse 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Now, what kind of thing is this? If Think about it. If you see something coming towards you in the middle of the night, walking on water, in a storm, you gonna scream? Yes. Really? No, man. I'll be paddling myself out of there. I don't want you to see me. But the disciples, the disciples were afraid, and it tells you something here that even though they were followers of Christ, they were still influenced by the customs of the time. Right? They believed in spirits, right? Because they did not have a, a better understanding. Okay? Now, when Christ compelled the disciples to leave the shore of Basilia and go to Capernaum, they lingered. Had they left in time, the, at the time the command was given, that would have made, they would have made it to the other, other side of the storm, or at least Ahead of the storm, however, even in his current state, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus and had faith that Christ could protect him, he was safe. Sometimes like Peter, the storm, some, sometimes like Peter, the storm, or in, in some cases, peaceful times in our lives can cause us to take our eyes away from Jesus. In the entire ordeal, even though Peter took his eyes off Christ, Christ never took his eyes off Peter. And likewise, though we may take our eyes off Jesus, we can have the assurance that Jesus will never take his eyes away from us. Amen. We can have faith in one thing, though all else fails, Jesus saves. Though all else fails, Jesus saves. All right. <clears throat> now, some 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 people may argue that Jesus saved. It, it was easy for Jesus to save Peter, but I, because after all, Peter was his friend. He had sent him out on missionary journeys. They ate together. They hang out together. He broke. He did miracles in their presence. But I challenge you to to look down a few months later. As Jesus hangs on that cross dying, the thief on the right side, between two thieves, the one on the left um, scolded him, and the one on the right, with his hope mingled with anguish in his voice, cast himself on the dying Savior. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, Christ, even though he was in agony, made time to save one more person. Yes. Right? And this is the faith that we have, the faith that we should demonstrate. That even in our lowest point, and there's no lower point than where that thief was spiritually, but in, incidentally it also was probably the highest point, but being on that cross, as life is fading, he had the faith to call on Christ. Amen. We, as Christians, as followers of Christ, are to display that level of faith. The faith of Peter walking on water. The faith of the, the, the thief on the cross asking for salvation. Now, the pinnacle of the story of the thief on the cross, or the account of the thief on the cross, um, I 
think I missed something. But the pinnacle of the story is not that the thief had enough faith to lean on Christ. Neither is the pinnacle of the, of the night on the lake about Jesus walking on water or Peter walking on water. The overarching theme was then and still is today that Jesus saves. Amen. And if we can remember that as we go through this week, if you forget every, everything, everything else I said today, just remember this one thing, that Jesus, Jesus saves. Amen. Let us pray. Amen. Father in heaven, the message has been uh, presented. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would use not me or my voice, but your words, that as we go through this week, that we can look back on this message and find hope, not in ourselves, but hope knowing that Jesus saves. Amen. Amen.